I'm David Wall Rice, Professor of Psychology at Morehouse College and lead for the Identity, Art, and Democracy Lab. Uh, today in our Crown Forum conversation, we are engaging in what we anticipate as a baseline for institutional work that faculty and key college stakeholders will engage in with the text Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex power and assault on campus. The book, roundly celebrated by Science Publishers Weekly, The Atlantic Esquire, and NPR naming it as one of its best books of 2020, is authored by Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan, who are with us today to unpack the book, but more importantly, to explore behaviors and contexts that mitigate sexual violence on campus. Jennifer Hirsch is a professor of sociomedical sciences at Columbia's Millman School of Public Health, and Seamus Khan is a professor of sociology and American studies at Princeton University. Jennifer and Seamus, it is a huge pleasure to have you here with us today to be in conversation. Thank you so much, David. We're really, we're honored to share the work with you all. Of course. And, and, and so let's just, you know, jump right in. Can you tell us about the work, you know, how, how it started? I know that it's, it's, it's related to the, the shift study. Can you tell us, you know, the dynamics behind it, please? Yeah, and actually, I will do that, but I'll open with a quick vignette. So sure. one of the things that we learned um, in the research, talking with students, um, every single Black woman we spoke with, every single one, told us a story of unwanted, non-consensual sexual touching. And that is not um, a problem that can be addressed by a course on consent in the first week of school because it's about racism. It's not just about sexual assault. And so we, um, the question that we, we lift up in uh, Sexual Citizens is what can be done to prevent that? Um, in 2014, when the project started, most of the conversation on campuses across the country was focused on how to um, improve adjudication processes, which is super important, but Seamus and I are social scientists and we like to stay in our lane. And our, so our lane is understanding the social production of sexual violence um, in, the, in the hopes that um, in understanding it, we can map out a path forward. And so the path forward is what Sexual Citizens lays out, um, a actually pretty optimistic vision of all of the changes that we could make, not just on campus, but in society so that sexual violence is less common. Okay. And so, and, and, and as you say this, the, the book is centered around these kind of three big ideas. Can you, can you talk to us about that a little bit? Absolutely. So the, the big three ideas in the book are sexual projects, sexual citizenship, and sexual geographies. And they point to a different way of thinking about assault. So, so much of the work on assault is about broken people, right? There is some sociopath who's hiding in the bushes and looking to commit harm. But, you know, most people are assaulted by somebody they know, frequently by somebody that they've had some previous sexual contact with. And so Jennifer and I wanted to step back and say, we need a different way of thinking about this. And the three concepts are that way. So sexual projects is the answer to the question, what is sex for? And it might seem like only a pair of academics could ask that kind of question, what is sex for? But as it turns out, it's for lots of different things for people. It's sometimes for coming to understand who you are. So among LGBTQ people, we saw that sex was often a project of identity formation, coming to understand their gendered and sexual identities. Um, sometimes it's for pleasure, um, but a lot of sex isn't that pleasurable, often for women, um, especially in heterosexual contexts. Frequently it's, it's, it's to connect with a partner, to give a partner what they need. Um, sometimes it's part of a status project. And so, you know, we began to think about what are the varieties of reasons that people have the kinds of sex that they do, and could we use that to try and make sense of why assault happens? And Jennifer, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to take on what sexual citizenship is. Sure. Um, and then I think we can illustrate them through a story. Um, yeah. So sexual citizenship is the idea that people have the right to choose their own sexual experiences, but that they need to understand that um, other people have those same rights. Uh, so it's, you know, there's been, I think, a general undermining of young people's sexual citizenship. And so the title is a little bit of a provocation um, in that we can't, um, 
we can't really address campus sexual assault or any sexual assault unless we let go of the idea that young people don't have a right to have sex at all. Um, and I, we could talk more about how young. Um, and so Seamus is going to talk more about uh, sexual geographies and then pull it together. So sexual geographies is the idea that space matters, that control over space is really essential, but also the dynamics of space. So, um, you know, I'll tell you the story of Charisma um, to try and pull these sort of three strands together. Charisma was um, a Black and Latina woman who um, described to us campus, the Columbia and Barnard campus, where we did the research, as a white space. And so she said, you know, it's filled with like white guys who drink too much, listen to terrible music and can't dance, and who don't find me attractive. And so this experience of hers of campus as like, a, a aggressive drinking culture, you know, not really culturally matching with what she wanted, and finding herself being viewed as someone who wasn't as attractive as, you know, her white and Asian peers, pushed her off campus a little bit. So she talked to, she, she met a guy through her roommate, um, who lived out in Brooklyn. And for those of you who know the sort of the geography of New York, getting from Morningside Heights in northern Manhattan to you know, deep Brooklyn, it's a it's a schlep. Like it it takes some time on the subway to get there, and so she gets to this guy's house. Um, it's kind of a disastrous subway ride, as it often is on weekends when the subway's not really working. And she finds himself herself in the, this room with this guy, and she's you know they're making out. She's fine with that, and then he starts to put her ha his hand on her body in a way that she doesn't like, and she moves his hand away, and then he does it again, and she says to us. You know, I never had a plan B. My plan A was always body language. And I didn't know what to do when somebody didn't respond to that. And then she described, in her words, having sex with him twice, uh, um, even though she also described saying no to him um, uh, when he first initiated that sex. Um, and one way to read this story is to think about that guy and his pathology. Mm -hmm. But what Jennifer and I want to point to is many other things that are important for explaining Charisma's experience. Mm -hmm. The first is the geography of campus life. You can't make sense of why it was that Charisma found herself out in deep Brooklyn if you didn't think of campus as a kind of white space. And so the geography of that space really matters. Class matters in this story. Charisma was out there and some students would have been able to open up their phone call, you know, use a ride app and pay the $50 to get back. She couldn't. But the other thing is to think about her sexual citizenship. Her understanding of her right to say no to sex was really underdeveloped. And we don't say that to blame charisma. In some ways it's to blame the communities that raised her that didn't give her a sense of the legitimacy of that. The second failure of sexual citizenship was the man in that room with her who didn't recognize her right to say no to sex. And then the third thing we would point to is Charisma's sort of lack of a clear sexual project. You know, mm -hmm. so many young people are raised up in contexts where they're told about the importance of a career and picking the right major and figuring out like where they wanna be in life. But in general, when it comes to sexuality, which is one of the ways that we connect to people who are the most important to, to, to us, frequently communities are ruled by silence. They say, well, we don't wanna hear about it. So nobody sort of sat charisma down and said, sex is gonna be a really important part of your life. It's gonna be a way that you connect to people who are important to you. You should think about what you want from that and how you're gonna make that want a reality. And so there we begin to see how sexual projects, sexual citizenship and sexual geographies kind of fit together to give us a different sort of analysis for charisma's experience. So how do you get folks to, I'm, I'm curious, how do you get folks to, to resonate with that? Because it sounds so formal, right? So we're, we're talking in terms of this, this formality. So what if people, say, it, it's almost like, you know, when, if you have partners that say, well, we don't have time to have sex anymore. Well, let's plan it. Well, that takes all of the fun out of, you know, and this is like hyper planning and situating this thing that is, I guess, thought of as being so natural. So how, how do you, how do you refigure this um, so that, that folks feel 
that this makes sense for them. And it's not just a thing that you, you happen upon and that just, you know, two souls collide and then everything's beautiful, you know? Right. I mean, sex is, is not a cognitive act. Um, it's a social act and, and we, that's how we present it um, in Sexual Citizens. I want to dive a little deeper into Charisma's story to answer that because she, you get to know her as you read the book and um, she had several other hard experiences. She had a, a boyfriend who was verbally sort of humiliating to her, verbally abusive, and it took her a while to develop some clarity about what she wanted sex to be like for her. She was like, you know what? I don't want to have sex outside of a relationship. I want to have sex with someone who cares about me, who knows me. Um, and think about how she had to figure that out for herself um, and compare that to the work that we do teaching young people to drive, right? I know not all young people learn to drive now, but when they do, there's actually a social project to make sure that they can do what is a pretty dangerous thing and is widely regarded as a step to adulthood in a way that doesn't hurt other people. So you don't learn how to drive by having a series of fender benders. You learn how to drive by practicing, right? With, and everyone acknowledges that as you become an adult, that is a thing that is legitimate to want. And it's not just the skills development, but there's a whole social policy scaffolding so that there are state laws there where you can't drive at night when you're a practicing driver and you can't have all your friends clowning around in the back seat. And then there's road design and there's car design. So like we have built a world where it's pretty safe to learn how to drive. And we have not yet built a world where it's pretty safe to learn how to have sex. So you talk to us about charisma and it's in, 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 in the story setting that you have for this, this, this first, uh, interaction that you're describing to us where she's like I, I'm saying no and she didn't have a you know a, a, an alternative to to this body language you also in the book talk about a young man who you're talking to who realizes ah, I've I've committed sexual assault right and so can you can you talk to us that, about that as well because it seems that you know, with you all explaining this and talking about it in terms of being projects this 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 geography that becomes so important, it allows us to understand ourselves in different ways um, that are so important, right? To where we haven't we haven't explored or examined these things at all before. So, can you talk about that? Because again, we're looking at people as being these sociopaths or things like that who are committing these crimes. But and and this again is not to excuse, but we're we're pro we're providing a context within which people are engaging in violence. Can you talk about this, young man? Absolutely. You know. Um... And it kind of points to this approach where, you know, Jennifer and I take the stance that we're not going to punish our way out of these problems, you know, and if we're going to take some lessons from our disastrous experiment with mass incarceration over the last 40 years, it's that community transformation doesn't come from punishing things after they happen. It's got to come from community inventions that seek to build communities where those kinds of harms don't happen. So Austin, the story you're referring to, David, was like really kind of a charming guy, like someone who was really pleasant to, to interview. And, and he, you know, he told us a story about how in his junior year, he was living in New York with, um, you know, and his girlfriend was living in New York and the kind of only hot steamy sex scene in the book is with him on 4th of July where, you know, they made their own fireworks. And mm -hmm. um, Austin was really dedicated to his girlfriend and her sexual pleasure. And um, they had nicknames for the different kinds of orgasms that she had. But he also told us a story how in freshman year, um, he found himself in the room of a woman who was a stranger to him. Um, his roommate wanted to uh, have sex with his girlfriend. And so his roommate and his roommate's girlfriend said, hey, Austin, why don't you go off to my room? The girlfriend's room and so austin gets into that room and the woman uh, who is the girlfriend's roommate says to austin i don't want to do anything now first just take a step back imagine a stranger walks into your room and you feel it necessary to say to them i don't want to do anything sexual like mm -hmm. what kind of world do women live in that that's actually a normal or gut reaction that she has Wow. But Austin didn't listen to her and he got into bed with her and started to touch her body. 
And then at one point in time, he just, he stopped and he sort of said to himself, this isn't the thing, this isn't what I want. And um, Austin told us that story. And then later in the interview, we asked Austin, what's sexual assault? And he said, well, sexual assault's any unwanted sexual touching. And then his eyes kind of welled up and he said, fuck me. Uh, because it was sort of the first time he realized, you know, he told us this story as like an awkward or weird sexual experience, but it was the first moment that he'd sort of realized that he probably committed sexual assault. And he experienced this as a real profound failure of himself. It wasn't something that he wanted to do. And he was having a hard time reconciling that experience with who he was today. Now, what that story tries to open up is a discussion of sexual assault where we're not excusing Austin's behaviors. Like what he did was wrong, but it's important to make a distinction between acts that are wrong and ways that we might prevent them and people who are inherently bad. And you know, one of the things that we draw upon in order to make this connection is the work of Khalil Muhammad who wrote this book, The Condemnation of Blackness. And in it, he, he shows how there was lots of crime at the turn of the 20th century, but social scientists worked to understand black men as criminals, as a kind of person, whereas white men were conceptualized, particularly white immigrant men, as people who committed criminal acts. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to transform the harm that people are doing as acts of perpetration versus perpetrators? some kind of mm -hmm. fundamental flaw in their being. And Jennifer and I wanna pivot the conversation so that we think about what are the systems or contexts that make acts of perpetration more likely and how can we intervene to prevent them? So how can we not just pathologize people as like trying to and committing these terrible harms while at the same time acknowledging that there are harms that need to be addressed? Mm. So can you t can you talk to it? That's so, so important to hear. I really appreciate that perspective and framing for us. C can you talk to us? I'm, I'm interested now in pivoting a little bit to to power. Right. So the, the power and how sexual assault is so associated there. And can you talk about what it is that you 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 were able to understand perhaps differently and more incisively around power as it relates to gender, as it relates to sexual expression and orientation and, and disability and other social identities? Can, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah. So there, there are two um, two ways that we come at power in the book. The first is to build um, on all of the sort of the, the feminist work on sexual assault, which has grounded it in relation to gender. You can't understand sexual assault without thinking about gender. And uh, if that's the only form of power that you look at, you're missing a lot. So, so we take, um, I think in this, in this conversation, we can label that as an intersectional approach to power. And then the second um, way that we look at power is to lift up situational power and the ways in which things like control over space or age differences or differences in drunkenness um, can be part of power. So I'll tell, tell you a story and sort of pull those things apart. Um, uh, and this is like the prototypical uh, assault of a freshman woman that people think about when they think about campus sexual assault. So Lucy had gone to boarding school, um, white girl, very sheltered, was excited to get to campus, meet some boys, lose her virginity. Um, she and her roommate uh, were in a bar, uh, orientation week, um, and some seniors started buying them drinks, some uh, white guys in a fraternity, and it felt like pretty exciting. And so um, Lucy, uh, Scott, the senior, invited Lucy back to his fraternity, and um, she wanted to go. So they stumbled up Amsterdam Avenue, um, you know, stopping to make out. Uh, Lucy's phone was ringing and it turned out it was her friend back from the bar because her friend had gotten that bystander intervention. And so she wanted to check up on Lucy. So friend meets them at, outside the fraternity. They go in, um, Scott offers them drinks. Um, not that anybody needed more drinks at that point, but Scott offers them drinks. Um, fraternities are not allowed to serve hard alcohol, which doesn't mean they don't do it. It just means that it's hidden. And so they go upstairs to the second floor in this building where they've never been, where Scott lives. 
uh, the friend like sips her drink and passes out immediately. And then Scott invites Lucy up to his bedroom. Um, she wants to go. So she goes up to his bedroom. Um, they make out some more. He starts to unbutton her pants. She says, no, don't. To which he says, it's okay. But it wasn't okay because then he raped her. And so like your hot take on this gut-wrenching story could be Scott is a terrible person. And our take on it is that what Scott did, just to build on what Shane said, so what, to, what Scott did was a terrible thing. And if you only understand that moment in terms of the power of a man over the power of a woman, you're missing so much about that situation that points to things that we could change. So Scott was older and we have sort of campus life set up in a way where younger women um, are funneled into encountering older men on spaces that those older men control because first year students have very hard time uh, securing and consuming alcohol where they live. Um, so Scott was older, he was less drunk, he was surrounded by friends in a space that he controlled. He probably had five inches and 40 pounds on her. So there were all kinds of ways in which that power, the power of a senior who is a wealthy white man, literally silenced her so that when she said no, and he said, it's okay, then he didn't hear anything else. And he was like, okay, I guess it's okay, right? That's like the most charitable interpretation that you could give. And then um, maybe Seamus can unpack a little bit more how we, the ways in which we, we um, contend with whiteness and um, other power inequalities in the book. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, another part of that story is the drinking part of that story. Mm -hmm. And so much of our attention to sexual assault revolves around drinking. And take a step back, drinking is important to understanding assault. But you know, we, the project that we were part of, there was a, another part of the project, which was a survey portion that was run by a uh, researcher, Claude Ann Mellons, who co-directed SHIFT with Jennifer. So our book draws upon the qualitative portion of the research, Claude's is the quantitative portion. And, and in the survey that Claude directed as part of that um, uh, quantitative portion, one of the things that we found was that, you know, 57% of the assaults involved were perpetrated because the person said um, alcohol was the method of perpetration. But that means that like almost half of them, it wasn't alcohol. But it's not mm -hmm. just that it's not alcohol. We need to remember that alcohol consumption is socially patterned. So white Americans drink considerably more than Asian Americans and black Americans. And so many of the interventions that are targeted towards drunken assault actually don't speak to the black experience. So the black experience of assault is much less likely to include experience alcohol. It's actually much more likely to be centered around relationship violence and intimate partner violence, what we would think of as, as that context. And so we would note that like, you know, in some ways the interventions and the kind of classic nature of Scott and Lucy's stories centers whiteness as what the typical experience is. And that underserves Latino students, it underserves Asian students, it underserves Black students, it also underserves queer students who have also have a different kind of experience. And just very briefly, another story, we talked to a young man named Adam, who grew up in a very religious household in the Midwest that basically denied his sexuality. And um, he was super excited to go to New York because he was like, I get to be a gay man in New York City and what could be better? But unfortunately, when Adam got to New York, he was like, well, actually, a lot could be better than being a gay man in New York City, because the values that his family had instilled in him may have silenced his sexuality, but they deeply affected him in terms of what he wanted out of a relationship. In particular, he wanted a relationship. And he found that like meeting guys on Grindr and Tinder, basically guys would hook up with him and then ghost him. And he was like, this is not what I want. So he finally found a boyfriend and he was super happy to have his have a boyfriend but he said to us in the interview, you know, the only problem with my boyfriend is that he can be really forceful about sex sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then Adam told us a story about how his boyfriend came home one evening, pretty drunk. And in Adam's words, he basically raped me. And except Adam then backpedaled and was like, refused to call it rape, wouldn't talk to his friends about it. And if we want to read that, I think there's a few things that are important to recognize. First, when we talk about alcohol, 
it's important to talk not just about victimization, but perpetration. We don't have enough of a conversation about how alcohol makes people do things that they might not otherwise do because they're not good at picking up on social cues. They're not really good at reading situations. We're not always our best selves. But the second thing is that Adam's inability to kind of express himself with his boyfriend was partially built on a foundation of homophobia where his sexuality being continually denied, his sexual citizenship being continually denied created a context where like he didn't understand that he ever had the right to say yes to sex. And if you don't understand that you have the right to say yes to sex, it's really hard to understand the context where you also have the right to say no to sex. And so to return to sort of Jennifer's point, this layers on the insights about power is, you know, gender and power important? Absolutely. But the first story Jennifer told about every single Black woman we met telling us the story of unwanted touching, that is not a story of gender-based violence. That's racialized violence, where Black women's bodies are seen as available, accessible, and, you know, just not Black women don't have legitimate autonomy. That's part of racism. You know, the story of that she told of Scott and Lucy shows many kinds of situational and contextual power. And then the story of Adam shows the power of homophobia and how that really influences young people in terms of their vision of their own sexual citizenship and puts them at risk. So how do you all see that playing um, at an environment like Morehouse College? So my, Morehouse College is obviously an all black men's institution right across the street is Spelman College. So it's almost like a university space, right? You walk across the street and, and Spelman's there, but Spelman is an all women's institution. You have Clark Atlanta University, which is men and women, you have Morris Brown College, but, but you still have these spaces that are all men, all women. How does that, how does it play differently? And, and I'm trying to figure, because I'm thinking about the research that you've done and the studies that you've, you've, you've engaged in were, you know, in these white spaces. So if we're talking about, you know, these sexual geographies, how does it translate into a space like Morehouse College, um, it, it, and, and this is kind of, again, a, a rarefied space because it's at once an all men's college. But of course, there is, you know, there are classes that are taken at Spelman College, but there is there is also an investment in an understanding of what it means to be a black man and what it means to be a black woman in those in those two spaces. So how does that complicate things and how does that blur how it is that you all might be able to use your template in these in these spaces? So I think we can take a stab at how it translates, but I think that the translation is um, what we what we know is that that it does translate. Um, the ideas of sexual geography, sexual projects, and sexual citizenship you could think of them as buckets to fill, and on every campus those what's in those buckets will look different. But I am sure that across the physical context of the campus there are spaces that are more or less prestigious that are controlled by more or less powerful students. So space becomes a map of power on campus. And so who has space, both spaces for socializing and spaces for sex. One thing that we saw um, both at Columbia and at Barnard is that there's sort of a naturalization of the idea that as students move through school, they have access to better space. And what that does is it builds inequality into the campus community because the older students who are also um, more adjusted to campus life, you know, farther along in their development, have more settled in terms of friends, um, more sexual experience, also have better space to have parties and have sex, right? So that younger students, if they're gonna, and particularly younger women, um, when they want to be with someone, they're, they're sort of funneled into those spaces controlled by older men. So I think that looking at how space and power map together is important. And then I think one thing that, that you all have that, that Columbia doesn't have as an advantage is um, a, a history as a, as a religiously grounded institution, right? It, it, in, a, in, a form, in a firmly secular context, it's complicated to think about what a conversation about sexual projects would look like because that is really much more of like a family um, personal conversation. But if you all are in an intentional moral community, 
then I think that there is room for our conversation. Um, you know, and I say this with a lot of humility as a parent, you could tell your kids all you want about what sex should be for and they're gonna make their own decisions. But I think that at least providing a context to have that conversation is, is an opportunity. Um, and I don't know, Seamus, I'm sure that there are things that you'll fill in there. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as, as Jennifer kind of indicated, like what we're hoping to provide is a heuristic or a way that a community can sort of take these concepts and apply them. And so, you know, one of the things that we know in the Columbia and Barnard situation is that by national rule among fraternities and sororities, sororities can't hold parties that have alcohol and fraternities can. What does that do? Well, it gives men frequently control over the spaces where party life happens. It doesn't make them bad people, but it does create a gendered context of inequality that is more likely to result in kinds of negative outcomes. And so I think it's sort of, you know, the, the other side of the power conversation is the equality conversation. Mm -hmm. And a big part of what Jennifer and I argue is that equality is the pathway to prevention or one of the pathways to prevention. And so how can you build equality into your institution from the bottom up? And how can you think about that as part of your sexual assault prevention strategy? And it's sort of a weird way to think because I think so many students, when they think about sexual assault, they think to like the lessons on consent, right? But let's return to the driving analogy that Jennifer outlined. Like if you just learn how to stop at stop signs, like that's all you know, are you gonna be a very good driver? Like, absolutely not. Like you still need to know so many other things beyond that. You need to think well beyond consent. And consent is incredibly important. Like you need to stop at stop signs and red lights. Like if you don't do that, you're gonna get in crashes, but it's not the only way you get into a crash. Mm -hmm. And so what we're hoping is that we expand, we're helping to expand the conversation beyond just gender inequality. So gender inequality needs to be part of the analysis of the relationship between these two institutions, but with a, with a recognition that it's not the only kind of inequality. And if there are other kinds of inequality built into the fabric of campus life, be that um, any kind of institutionalized homophobia or mm -hmm. inequalities in relationship to class, right? Like, you know, this may be a black institution, but there's way more variation in that institution than blackness captures. There's going to be wealthy students and poor students. There are gonna be students from rural areas and urban areas who are more comfortable in contexts. There are gonna be people with different gendered and sexual identities. And so, you know, this is going to make the institution sort of built in inequalities. Inequalities that are not the responsibility of the institution because they happened way before anybody got there but inequalities that the institution has to think through and ask itself, how are we going to try and address these so that people don't experience a range of harms? And one of those harms is the harm of sexual assault, but it's not the only one. So what are, I, and I, oh man, this is so fascinating. I really appreciate you all. Um, so so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about what it is that Jennifer just said, um, just prior to you speaking, Seamus, in, in terms of um, Morehouse having a, a special um, opportunity here, right, to apply these heuristics in meaningful ways because of the moral space out of which it, you know, it exists. So um, I'm, I'm curious in, in this, how would you, what are our responsibilities as people, as, as folks who are here at Morehouse College who are teaching leaders, right? Who are teaching leaders who have a moral and ethical um, center and responsibility. Um, uh, and, and, and as the students who are, you know, to, to, to walk in that pathway. What are, what, what do you see us as doing? I mean, I, I'm pausing and stuttering here because I'm, I'm anticipating your answer is like, just read the book and do everything we say in there. But what are, what are, what are things that, that we should think about we, needing to do? 
Um, so I think particularly in relation to building leaders, um, the citizenship, the citizenship conversation um, is a, this, so there's a sexual dimension of that. What do people owe each other um, sexually? What are their rights and obligations in terms of their own autonomy and seeing the people that they're having sex with as people um, who have those same rights and obligations. Um, so I think that fits in the broader conversation about what does it mean, what, what, what are we to each other in community? What do we owe each other? And then the sexual projects conversation, I think this is, um, it, it's, it's a complicated one to enter into as a whole community because of that diversity. I'm sure you have students from different religious backgrounds, you have students from different family backgrounds. Um, so people have different, ideas about sexual morality. And I mean, Seamus and I sort of um, put a twist on the whole idea of talking about sex and morality because so much of that conversation has focused on acts like don't put tab A in slot B, that's forbidden. And we are agnostic about that. And instead, the moral question is how people, what people owe each other as humans, how we should treat each other. Um, so actually in Sexual Citizens, we point to a lot of terrible things that students do to each other that are not assault, but that are just cruel or unkind. Um, and so I think scaffolding a conversation about um, what is what people think is good, right? Like I think you can actually talk about goodness and what people feel is meaningful and what they're searching for both sexually and otherwise. You know, we didn't speak with a single young person who had really been fully satisfied by the adults in their lives in terms of those conversations about sex. Um, and that's in the context of a much broader, and this is another thing that Morehouse could do, um, we are deeply committed in America to sexual ignorance, like profoundly and deeply in a way that is reflected in so many policies. Um, but uh, we, one of the survey found that young women who'd had sex education before college that included training and how to say no to sex they didn't want to have, which is not abstinence only sex education. It's just good sex education because it includes a skills development component. They were half as likely to be raped in college. Mm -hmm. And um, we know in America, the landscape of sex education is very unequal. There are nine states that mandate that if sex education is provided, it must be homophobic. Like, and you heard me right. Um, so you have students coming in with all with the widely varying levels of just basic understanding about sex. And I think, you know, to start with the sexual projects conversation without acknowledging the fundamental sexual illiteracy, it's a little bit like starting with calculus when people don't know how to add. So I think thinking about what is a non-embarrassing way to provide young people with opportunities to make up for the information they've been denied is also like, that's a programmatic thing that you can do. And there are, there are great online videos from Planned Parenthood. And so that's, um, there are ways to, to do that, um, to start beginning the conversation. And there, and there are great religiously grounded forms of sex ed, the Our Whole Lives curriculum, which has both a secular and a religious um, uh, curriculum is incredible. And it takes a life course perspective from, you know, being very young to being old um, and, and what kinds of education you need. I think also, you know, um, what Jennifer and I are kind of calling for is connecting the lessons of moral personhood and respect and recognition to sexuality. And you know, if the only moral conversation that we have about sexuality is either who you can't have sex with because it's forbidden or the one context where you can have sex, pretending like just because something happens in marriage, suddenly there's moral respect and recognition, like that is not sufficient. And so, you know, what part of what we're calling for is like young people get so many lessons about respect and recognition and like they need to be tied to, to um, intimacy. So, you know, if, if you've got a kid who's a biter, you kind of say like, don't bite, right? And it's important not to bite or who like is a toucher or it, as you convey to kids like that they have the right to their own bodies and they need to respect other people's rights to their bodies. That is a sexual assault prevention message. 
But the lessons of bodily autonomy, the lessons of respect and recognition need to be tied to how it is that we act in terms of our connections and intimacies with others. And that's what these moral conversations can and should look like. Jennifer Hirsch, Seamus Khan, the book is Sexual Citizens, a Landmark Study of Sex, Power, and Assault on Campus. I thank you so much for sharing your time with us and look forward to continuing this conversation with our campus community in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for lifting up our work and having this conversation. You